last session in this entire course and it's hard to believe that the time has gone so uh, fast and we have covered uh, uh, so little material. Oh, the depth of the Word of God. We've hardly scratched the surface and I assure you I feel the weakness of that and wanting God to literally expand these scriptures in your mind and your heart until the cross style is literally drilled into your thought process and you see the perspective that uh, Matthew has but especially that Jesus has as he literally spills the message to his disciples and is going to spend six months uh, uh, drilling them on the idea and bringing them constantly back to this one single thing, that he is a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah, and that he's calling them to be a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. If I had one goal for this class, and one goal for this entire course, it would be that somehow, some way, this concept would so ingrain itself into your thinking and would become such a part of you that you would always view Jesus in terms of the style of the cross. And that you would imbue everything, every act of ministry, every expression of ministry, everything that's going on in and through your life, you would view it all as coming down to this one single thing, the style of the cross. That you would always be redemptive, that this would grip your inner heart, and that the very nature of God would begin to spill through you and would produce this in your own life. And of course, as I think about that and as I look at that, I become very much aware of the fact that that isn't anything that I'm going to impart to you or that just teaching a course and giving you ideas will, uh, will in instill within you. That that's going to come because the very essence of his nature drills within you. Oh, it flows. It's, it's filling your bloodstream. It's moving through your very heart. It's becoming the passion of your very being. And because it becomes a passion of your, of your very being, you are incapable of doing anything else but the style of the cross. And this becomes your whole perspective of ministry and, and of who Jesus is and of the kingdom. And everything, everything is seen in light of this one single fundamental, the style of the cross. You see, the cross is the fundamental of the kingdom of God. It's the foundation point of everything that's happening in the kingdom. And there is no ministry, friend. No ministry will take place unless it spills through the style of the cross. We are coming rushing into verse 22 and 23 of chapter 17. And these are, oh, these are, these are such powerful verses. These may be the most important verses of the entirety of the passage. They have to do, of course, with the verification, the confirmation that Jesus indeed is a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. And now Jesus is coming right back to say the same identical thing again. He had said it before, now he's going to say it again. And he's going to say it in verse 22 and 23. Uh, take your Bibles, let's view these verses together. This is the second prediction concerning his death and his resurrection. Now while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Let's read it again. Now while they were staying in Galilee... Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up. Powerful verses. Again, these two verses may be the most important verses in the entirety of this chapter 17. Why would they be so important? Well, they're not important, of course, because uh, they give us additional information. See, that same information we already have had given to us. And it's over in chapter 16, verse 21, where Jesus turns to his disciples. Oh, read it again, will you? And compare it. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. See, there's no real additional information given in verse 22 and 23. So that's not the reason it's important. He's really restating all over again what he told them the first time. 
He's making a, a new emphasis for them. They've had lots of experiences in the in-between time. And he's had this long argument with them. And now he's coming back to the same old truth, man. Hey, guys, let's go back to where I started. All the arguments you've done, all the stuff that's happened in between. Let's go back where I started. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. And they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise up. He will be raised up. So, so guys, you got to come back to what I tried to tell you before. So he brings them back to the same fundamental message all over again. So it's not important. These are not important because of the new information that he gives to them. Why are they important? I want to propose to you that these two verses are the most important verses because of the, of the place that they hold in the sequence of the events. Did that make sense to you? See, it's the place that they hold in the sequence of the events. In other words, again, in saturation, we're back to the whole idea uh, of getting into the context and seeing the whole flow of what's taking place in the context of the passage itself. So as you begin to walk through and see this whole flow of where this is going, these verses now become really highlighted and really become underscored because not because they give new detail, but because they are a repeat of what he started with when, he, when this whole thing began. And they are again emphasizing all over again the style of the cross and the loss of your life and the give yourself up and that guys... Redemptive ministry is not going to happen without this. So, hey boys, I'm back to the same old place. And so here's a whole re-emphasis again. Now you remember what's happened in the last chapters. Let's just briefly run through it again. Just to get all the sequence into our mind. So we can see as we march up to this uh, how significant this really becomes. You remember in chapter 10, Jesus reached into himself, grabbed a hold of the power that he came, contained within himself, transferred it to his disciples. In fact, I want you to turn back to chapter 10, if you would, and let's uh, look at that, because there is, are some words that are really impactive as you see them uh, in that particular context and in that moment. It's in verse 1 of chapter 10. And when he had called his 12 disciples to them, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of diseases and all kinds of, all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. Now, what's so significant about that? Well, see, up to this time, they've been, called, they've been called disciples. Verse 37, he said to his disciples. All this time, they've been disciples. But do you realize that a shift is taking place? Look at verse 10, chapter 1. Or chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called his 12 disciples, there it is again, emphasis on disciples. But in this next verse, now the names of the 12 apostles. So you see, they've moved from disciples to apostles. And what was the difference? He's taken the power that he contains within himself, transferred it to his disciples, and sent them out to have power. He gave them power over unclean spirits, to cast them out, to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So, hey, they went out. <laughs> Man, it was stardom all the way, brother. They were so absolutely thrilled. Jesus gave them all instruction in chapter 10 of exactly how to use this power and what was to take place. And, and they went out. They were elated, man. They were absolutely higher on a kite. I mean, they couldn't believe demons come under our control. All the stuff we've watched Jesus do, we now are able to do ourselves. Thank God. Whoa, this is phenomenal. Stardom set in. Man, they learned to hold the microphone. They learned to make the right emphasis, told the right story at just the right time, moved on the guy just at the right moment, grabbed a hold of the hand, head, shook it just right, had the quartet sing. See, they they moved and grew, brother. They were, they were full of stardom. Hey, you can see what their self, how their self-centeredness would begin to play in this. And they got so wrapped up in the stardom and this is my best profile and oh, want my autograph? Okay. Hey, they really were into big crowds and big deals and who's the biggest and who's the best and see, they, they really groove on that. They're really moving on that, man. They're into that heavy. You come to chapter 16. 
Now in chapter 16, of course, Jesus has got them aside. And he's asked them, uh, who do you say that I am? And, and of course, they say, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Good, Jesus says. Now let's analyze the content of that. The content of Messiahship is cross style. And he introduces the idea of the cross style. He introduces the concept of the bleeding, suffering, and dying. He introduces this whole idea of losing your life. Which you understand is totally, absolutely, directly opposite of self-style. See, they're into self-style, self-glory, self-edification, self-building. Hey, what am I going to get? Wow, I'm popular. Whoa, how big I am. See, they're really into the self-stuff, the self-glory. Jesus is now calling him into cross-style. See, self-style... Cross style, self glory, cross glory. Hey, lose your life, give yourself up, pour your life out, never ever live for yourself. Over against, grab for yourself, build your own ministry, highlight your own ability. Hey, attract people to you, draw them to your own, get them under your domination, control, be the head of, organize, hey, dominate. Hey, it's all self glory. Over against, pour your life out, facilitate, give up, uh, pour, pour yourself out, die to yourself, cross style. See, that, that's the significance of what's going on here. So they've been into the self-glory. He's now calling them to the cross-glory. They've been into the self-style. He's now calling them to the cross-style. How did they respond to that? Oh, they rebuked on that one, man. They fell apart on that one. Again, you, you, you know the story. Hey, and in verse 22, Peter takes him aside of chapter 16 and rebukes him and says, Hey, we're not going to have that. That's not the way it's going to go down. No, sir, we're not putting up with that. We don't want that kind of style. We want self-style. We're into self-style, self-glory. Hey, we don't want cross-style, bleed, suffer, and die. And we don't want you into that. Because we know that if you get into that, we'll have to be into that. And we don't want that kind of style in our lives. So they re rebuked him. And there was a six-day argument that took place. And what are they arguing about? They're arguing about the glory style, the self-glory style, over against the cross style. That's the argument. Hey, which is going to win out? What is the fundamental of the kingdom? What is the heartbeat of the kingdom? Jesus says, guys, it's not self-glory style. Hey, the fundamental of the kingdom, the very depth of what's going on in the kingdom of God is the business of the style of the cross. And that's what I'm calling you to. Come on, bleed, suffer, and die. Give yourself up. I'm calling to, you to pour your life out. This is the essence of the kingdom of God. Come on, guys. So he calls them to it. Now they have this six-day argument. Chapter 17, he takes them to the Mount of Transfiguration. Moses and Elijah come down and literally overshadow the whole place and say, hey, it's the cross style, guys. It's the cross style. That's the essence of what's going down here. Jesus is a cross style, bleeding, dying Messiah. So get in on the program. Father overshadows the place. It's the cross style, guys. Listen to him. He's telling you the truth. It's the cross style. Hey, what's going on in Jesus in terms of spiritual reality now takes on a physical form and literally glows out of him. We see it radiating out of his being. And the only way we're ever going to get that is cross style, guys. Cross style. Got to go to a cross. Got to bleed, suffer, and die. Hey, no way out of it, man. That's the fundamental. They come down from the cross. On their way down from the cross, they discuss John the Baptist. What was John the Baptist into? What did he forerun? He didn't read, he, he did not forerun the self-glory style, man. He foreran the cross style. It was the cross style, brother. He was into poor Pouring his life out. Likewise, the Son of Man is going to join him in the same identical style. Bleed, suffer, and die. Come on, guys. You want to get in on it? Bleed, suffer, and die. Come on. Cross style. Hey, that's what we're into. They come to the base of the mountain. The disciples had moved into the self-glory style again. Hey, they were going to cast out the demons. No problem. Hey, the man would applaud them. Hey, they'd make a big impact on the crowd. They were into the self-glory style. Hey, they failed flat on their face. Ministry shut down. Now they've come to Jesus. Hey, why couldn't we do it? Guys, you didn't trust me. I was telling you about the cross style. Hey, I ask you to join me in the cross style. You rebuke me. And when you rebuke me, ministry shut down. So hey, Hey, you go along your way with the self-glory style, man. Hey, just build yourself up. But I'm telling you, you're going to be flat on your face every time in ministry because ministry is only going to happen by the cross style. I'm calling you to the cross style. Now, is it not significant that after all of that, 
he turns to them and gives verse 22 and 23. Like, hey guys, want to restate it? Hey guys, get this down. Hey guys, we didn't pass go and we didn't collect $200. Man, we're going back to the fundamental. We're going back to the starting point. And here's the starting point. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him and the third day he will be raised up. Don't get sidetracked, guys. Don't get off on self-glory. Don't get into the appeasing of the crowd stuff, guys. Come on. Don't get into, hey, my own, hearing my own voice. Come on, guys. Come back to the fundamental. And it is the style of the cross. The kingdom's going to be built, but it's not going to be built by glamour boys. It's not going to be built by hotshot programs, man. The kingdom of God is going to be built by involvement in pain, bleeding, suffering, and dying. I'm asking you to get involved in the pain and the hurt of your world. I'm asking you to lose your life. Come out of your little deal and all your own little thought process and all that you think is good for you. I'm asking you to pour your life out. Bleed, suffer, and die. I want you to intersect your world. And man, when you intersect your world, a cross is at the point of their need. A cross is formed. And when a cross is formed, blood is spilt, brother. Blood is spilt. And it's the bleeding, suffering, dying that redeems the world. That's what I'm asking you to bring, I'm asking you to get involved in the cross style and bring it into the pain of your world. I want you to meet your world at the point of their need so that a cross can be produced and when it's produced, redemption takes place. I'm calling you to the style of the cross and he brings them back to the restatement of it in verse 22 and 23. I want to start with an outline. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish it in the next class period. But the outline I want to start with in relationship to verse 22 is the movement of the Christ embracing the cross. So first of all, we want to talk about the movement of the Christ embracing the cross. Again, it's verse 22. Start with this, number one. The direction. It's verse 22. The direction headed for the cross. Listen to it closely. While they were staying in Galilee. Now if you get into the overall view of the ministry of Jesus, which you probably did in your saturation, you begin to realize where we are in the sequence of events. Of events. You realize that the Galilean ministry of Jesus is really over. In fact, he closed that out basically in chapter 14, I think it was, with the great feeding of the 5,000. And that's a phenomenal way to end your ministry, isn't it? Big banquet. Hey, that sounds like Jesus. He called all of, his, all of the multitudes and for one last time got them all together and, and a three-day deal, just had a three-day conference to impact them and, and then fed them all and, and take, took fish and bread and just stretched it and multiplied it until everybody had more than they wanted. It was the first free all-you-can-eat buffet. And they just filled themselves and took doggy bags home. It was a phenomenal occasion. And that ended the Galilean ministry. Now, that didn't mean that ministry was going to cease. That meant that ministry was going to take on a new focus. And then he moved into this section that we've been dealing with. The section where he's focusing on his disciples. And he really wants to get away from the clamor and the noise of all of Judaism. And especially of those multitudes who've gotten all wrapped up and touched my flesh. Make me feel better. Who, but who aren't really dealing and buying into the style of the cross. And buying into the redemptive process. So Jesus is dealing almost exclusively with his disciples in his own intent, rather, and his own motive. He's wanting exclusively to get them ready for the cross and to teach them the style of the cross. So he's calling them to that. He takes them into Gentile ter territory, which he's never done before. And again in chapter 16, they're in Caesarea Philippi, which is Gentile territory, trying to get away from the crowds and the pressure of the leaders of Israel. So all of that is taking place. So the Galilean ministry is basically over. Jesus is now come to the place where they're going to head for Jerusalem for the Feast of the Passover. It will be the last feast of the Passover for him. Maybe not for all of the Jews, but really it, it, it's, it's a period in that process. 
For Jesus is going to bleed, suffer, and die in that feast of the Passover. And on that Good Friday, He is literally going to accomplish the cross in Jerusalem. And the redemptive process is going to be completed, finished in that cross. So this is a significant happening. Now if we've got it figured out, again it's something like six months. It could give or take a little bit, but it's a six month period. Well, it doesn't, take six, it doesn't take six months to go from Galilee down to uh, Jerusalem. That's true. So you see, as you trace them, there's a lot of wandering around. And they stay put in some places for a while. But they're on their way. They're headed in that direction. Uh, he's made up his mind. Jesus knows where he's going. And he knows why he's going there. And he's trying to tell his disciples that. So you see, this is all about heading in a special direction. Now, as you really look at it, you'll note in verse 22 it says, and you got this no doubt from your saturation, that now while they were staying, staying in Jerusalem. Now, it, my Bible, of course, has a footnote, and it literally says, it reads in the earlier manuscripts, gathering to gather. So it wasn't that they were just coming to dwell. It wasn't that, hey, we've got some time on our hands, we want to kill some time because we don't want to go down there too early. So let's just kill some time and hang out at McDonald's. No, it was while they were gathering together. Now the indication is, and you pick this up, and you probably again got this from your saturation, you pick this up from some other, from the other Gospels, that there was a, a coming together of groups of disciples. That yes, Jesus had the twelve there, but then there were some other groups of disciples that, that heard about this and they were hanging out in, in Galilee, uh, probably at Capernaum. They were waiting there in order for the other groups to gather. And, and group after group began to come in. And there was a larger group involved in this whole thing than just the 11 disciples. For instance, we're made aware of the fact that the women, the women who were at the cross, yeah, the women who followed Jesus all that time. In fact, you can, uh, you can see this as you, uh, as you turn to Matthew chapter 27. And why don't you do that? When you turn to Matthew chapter 27, uh, it tells us about the women uh, that were at the cross. Uh, you can find it down in verse 55. Many women who followed Jesus from Galilee. Right there it is. Ministering to him were there looking on from afar. So that verse 55 of chapter 27 is distinctly connected to this verse back here in verse 22. Now while they gathered together in Galilee. So go back to chapter 27 now and look at verse 55 again. And many women who followed Jesus from Galilee ministering to him were there looking on from afar. Among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. So the women who were present at the cross started their journey with Jesus at this point. Mary Magdalene, the, Mar the other Marys, they all gathered in. And there was a group of women who began to associate themselves with Jesus on this trip. It says they were ministering to him. No doubt they did do the cooking. No doubt they helped out. No doubt they helped wash the clothes. They, they did those kinds of things. In fact, Luke tells us that these women were instrumental in the financial, meeting the financial needs of this trip. So they were buying the food. They were paying the bills. The women, the money came from these women as they began to participate in this journey. So these women have joined Jesus on his way south towards Jerusalem, the feast of the Passover. And of course, he knows that, it is headed, that he is headed for the cross. So this was not just for retirement, not just getting away. This was for a distinct purpose, the purpose of marching towards the cross. They are on the move, see? They are moving towards the cross. They are assembling together towards the cross. Now get this, this is really significant. Do you realize that while Jesus was making the statements of both the first prediction, Matthew chapter 16 verse 21, and the second prediction, Matthew chapter 17 verse 22, that while he was stating these things, he was actually taking the physical steps that were moving him in the direction of the cross. In other words, this is not lounge back, 
lounge back. Hey, turn the TV up. Yeah, pass the popcorn. Hey, my lazy boy recliner, feet kicked up. Hey, let me let's let's talk about a concept. Yeah, let's let's debate some philosophy. Let, let's uh, let's talk about some uh, spiritual stuff. Let's let's talk theology here. Yeah, what do you what do you think of the cross style idea? Yeah, what what's the deal here? Yeah, oh, you give me your opinion. Well, you give your opinion. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah, well, that's good. Well, hey, what? To, uh, oh, oh, the uh, uh, hey, the commercial's over. Back to the show. We'll talk about it some more when the commercial comes back on. See, that's not the deal here. See, Jesus is not lounging. He's not eating popcorn, son. Jesus is actually taking the steps, moving towards the cross while he's talking about the cross. As he's giving them the information, guys, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed. I'm telling you, they're going to kill me. Jesus was actually moving in physical steps, running, if you please, to embrace the cross. So this was not some pie in the sky. This was not... Whoa, maybe, maybe not. This was not, hey, we'll talk about it, but we'll never get around to it. This was not promises that aren't going to be kept. Do you understand? This is talking about the cross as they are actually headed for the cross itself. That really is significant. This is not just talk, folks. This is action. This is not just, oh, I preached the cross. This is, hey, I'm sick of your preaching, man. I want to know if you've embraced the cross. I want to know if you live the cross. See, it's one thing to talk about the cross. It's another thing to embrace the cross and actually have it living through your life. See, uh, th this verse is all about, hey, class is over, boys. Hey, the class is done, man. Hey, we're at the end of the course. Yeah, yeah, end of the course. Yeah, you get an A, so you're out. So the end of the course is over. Hey, we're done with the discussion. Listen, we've had all the bull sessions. We've debated this. We've kicked it around. Spent six weeks or, or six days arguing with you about this. Took you to a Mount of Transfiguration. Gone through all this stuff, brother. Hey, man, we beat this to death, folks. Hey, we've talked about it. We've analyzed it. We've outlined it. We've scrutinized it. Hey, we've diagrammed it on the back blackboard, man. Hey, we've, we, we've had PowerPoint. We've had, we've had uh, illustrate, we've illustrated it. We've given examples of it. Classroom is dismissed. Let's move, guys. Let's take steps to embrace the cross. Discussion is done. Hey, are you going to get with it now? Are you going to get on your knees and embrace the cross? Better than that, are you going to, are you going to let him literally live through you and embrace the cross on the street? Are you going to get involved in the hurt and the pain of your world? Hey, when are you going to quit talking about that? Well, I'm preparing. When are you going to quit, quit pre preparing and actually get into it? See, you can spend the rest of your life just preparing. Well, I'm getting ready. Yeah, well, i got to learn that. Well, now I need a PhD. Yeah, well, you know, I really got the PhD in the wrong field. What I need now is a PhD in, oh, communication. That's what I need. I need another degree in communication. And so on and on and on it goes. So we spend our whole life preparing. When are we actually going to roll up our sleeves and say, Hey, Jesus, bleed through me. Hey, that doesn't happen when you graduate. That doesn't happen when the course is over. That doesn't what happen when you finally get the last PhD, man. That happens right now, this moment. Hey, if you can't minister now, you won't minister when you get your PhD. If you can't minister now, well, when I get full-time, you won't minister when you're full-time either. Hey, I'm down at my job. This is so ironic to me because I've seen this a thousand, thousand times, see? Hey, if you can't minister when you're in the factory, if you can't minister when you got the job, if you can't minister when you're living in the dorm, if you can't minister there, if you can't roll up your sleeves and pour your life out, man, when you when you got a full when you got a full time pastorate and, and you got all these people to minister to, you're not going to minister then either. See, it's not all of a sudden, poop, it it's turned on and whoa, you're a phenomenal minister. See, that's not the deal. It's, hey, embrace the cross. So Jesus says, hey, I'm talking to you about this as I'm actually taking the steps towards the cross. So this is not just words for me, son. Hey, I'm actually in the actions of the cross itself. So I'm asking you to embrace this as we move. I'm asking you, let's take action. We're not talking about this anymore. The debate is done. It's time to embrace the cross. 
So what do you have? You have the movement of the Christ embracing the cross. You have the direction. He is headed for the cross. Even as he's talking about it, he's headed for the cross. Let me give you another idea. Number two. Number one, direction. Headed for the cross. Number two, selection. Single-mindedness about the cross. Now again, you see this in uh, verse 22 and the context of this verse 22. And it is so powerful. And we've already emphasized this somewhat, but hey, you've got to get this down. See, this is so powerful because Jesus is stubbornly down to it, single-mindedly, single-minded about the cross. See, you're not going to talk him out of it. Hey, six days with his disciples rebuking him isn't going to talk him out of it. See, he is absolutely stubbornly, I mean stubbornly, giving himself to this cross. I mean, he is wrinkling his brow, setting his chin like a flint to go to Jerusalem. And brother, you're not going to budge him. You can tell him all about the agony of the cross. You can tell him about how hard it is. You can give him all the negative picture about it. You can say anything you want to say. But I'm telling you, when it comes down to it, you're not going to get Jesus out of this cross. This is his choice. And he is, he is stubbornly, distinctly involved in and not going to give up the idea of the cross. The cross is the fundamental. I mean, he's not getting off of it. So... If you're going to be a kingdom person and you're going to be in touch with Jesus and he's going to indwell you, you can be rest assured, hey, he has a single mind, brother. He has one thing he's thinking about, only one thing he's attempting, only one thing that he's about. His whole nature is spilling in one direction. It's bleeding, suffering, and dying, redemptive ministry, hey, through the cross. This is all that's going on in the kingdom. So if you want to get involved with him, you're going to have to come back to this cross because it's the only only direction he's going in and it's the only thing he's got going on in his mind. He is stubborn about that. Now again, we found that out in chapter 16 in verse 21 in the language. Look at it again. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. So the grammar there is very clear. From that time, present tense with continual action. From that time, Jesus began to show. Hey, something started here that just, it was like pulling a plug. And an avalanche just gushed out. And you weren't going to be able to get the plug back in. Jesus was starting a communication on a subject that was going to go on and on and on and on and on. And man, he wasn't going to quit. I'm telling you, he isn't going to stop on this. Again, every single scene from this point on is going to bring them back to the style of the cross. Hey, you see it so intricate in everything that's going on. Every parable that Jesus tells, every concept he discussed, it all comes back to this subject of the cross, man. This is single-minded. He is marching towards the cross, physically headed towards the cross, and mentally locked in and won't talk about anything else, won't give credence to anything else. Everything comes under the umbrella of the subject of the cross. Again, the rich young ruler, all the trick questions that they're going to ask him over in chapter 22. Every, hey, the subject of the second coming, anything they want to throw at him, brother, he's going to bring them back to this one fundamental, overwhelming desperation that's going on within his brain. It's the push of his heart. It's the, thro the throb of his inner soul. It's the blood pressure of his system, man. And it's all about this cross, bleeding, suffering, and dying. And he's simply simply just will not get off of it. It's an avalanche of truth that comes from Jesus. And he, you can't talk him out of it. There is no compromise in it. There isn't, well, tone it down. There isn't, well, just talk about it on Sunday. No, it's going to be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's going to be every day of the week, every sermon I preach, everything I'm into. Hey, I'm down to one single thing. The absolute loss of your life and the total giving of yourself to the person of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, there is nothing else going on and there's nothing else to be a part of. The very nature of God living within you is going to drive you to this. See, Jesus is absolutely fixed on this. How, 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 how can I tell you that? How can I get you to strongly see that? He's absolutely fixed on this. 
There is no kingdom of God without this. You take this out of the kingdom of God and it deteriorates. It falls apart, man. You've only got some kind of a religious movement on your hand, a religious organization. You've not got a spiritual movement happening. Take the cross out, man. We're flat on our face. Jesus is fundamental. Jesus is down to it. Jesus is laying the foundation for the kingdom of God and it's going to be the essence of the cross. There's no way to escape it. This is basic. I found it true in my own life. I found it true in the life of the church. See, I have found that if I don't, if I don't single-mindedly, if, if I don't stubbornly keep my eyesight on the cross, see, if I don't just keep coming back to this, if I don't just consistently and constantly give my whole system to Jesus and His style, I, I soon gold plate the cross, dangle it on my neck, I soon downplay it. I soon glorify it. I soon take the splinters out of it. I, I, I very soon rush in and, and, and the cross becomes an emblem. The cross becomes theology. The cross becomes concept. The cross becomes an idea to talk about. Oh, it's Good Friday and we'll sing uh, the old rugged cross. But it doesn't have any teeth in it, see. It doesn't mean anything to me. It's not my life. It's so easy, friend, for the style of the cross just to slip through your fingers and for you just to fit into routines and, and programs and, and, and ceremonies and, and do certain stuff. See, the only way, the only way Christianity can stay reality and burn in your bones and, and move through your system is to stubbornly, single-mindedly uh, uh, stare at the cross. See, you've got, you got to come back. You've got to come back to the Jesus of the bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah. See, that's the only possibility for the kingdom to become reality. And if you don't, if you don't move your feet in the direction of, hey, literally, literally embracing the cross, if you don't take physical action in embracing the cross, and if you don't stubbornly in your mind systematically give yourself to fixed, absolutely fixed, concentrated and focused, will not get off of this, man. This is the one deal. Repeat and repeat and say it again and say it again. I'm, I'm back to Jesus and, the, and His suffering. I'm back to, oh, that I might know Him in the fellowship of His suffering, that I might join him in his dying, that somehow his life might, oh I want to bear in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus. If you don't fix on that, if you don't, let that be the passion of your life. If that doesn't come, become the dream of your system, if, it, if you don't desire with all your heart to be an extension of the blood process of Christ, then man, it'll, it'll slip through your fingers. You'll become anemic you, you, at best. You, you'll run a few programs, man, and, and attract, a, attract a little crowd and, and, and you'll, you'll, have, you'll have some stardom and, and, and you'll pull off some big deal and you'll develop your talent and you'll be a good performer and, and you'll be able to take up big offerings but you won't impact eternity brother. You, you won't literally come down to it and, and build the kingdom because that can only be done by the cross and its style. So what he's calling us to so I, I, I'm saying to you that in verse 22 and 23, what you're seeing is you're seeing Jesus actually headed for the cross physically. Direction headed for the cross. And you're seeing selection, single-minded single-mindedness about the cross. He is absolutely stuck on it. Hey, he's back to the subject. Back to it again. Hey, highlighting it all over again, guys. We're back to it. Square one. Here we are. What about the cross? What about the cross? I want to give you another idea. Uh, number one, we've talked about the idea of the direction headed for the cross. This is all under the, uh, the movement of the Christ. The movement of the Christ embracing the cross. And number one, his direction headed for the cross. Number two is selection, single-minded about the cross. Number three is connection connection. He is reaching out for you. Connection. 
Now, direction is fine. Yeah, oh, hey, Jesus, hey, I see him there. Yeah, he's headed for the cross, all right. Yeah, it's going to take him six months to get there. But whoa, headed for Jerusalem. He knows, yeah, he knows he's got that nailed down. He knows that this is his, this is his final trip. And uh, when he gets there to Jerusalem, hey, there'll be Pharisees waiting for him. Before he gets done, the Romans will get involved. And hey, he'll be nailed. So Jesus is actually taking steps towards the cross. Direction, headed for the cross. That's good. Hey, good for you, Jesus. Go for it. Selection. He stubbornly, single-minded about the cross. Will not give it up, man. Focused, oh brother, will not budge on this. Can't talk him out of it. Hey, good for you, Jesus. Hey, good for you. Uh, appreciate your dedication. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, you're headed that way. Good for you. Hey, I'll uh, listen. I'll hang around on the back. Yeah, I'll, I'll be out there. And, uh, yeah, I'll be. I'll be some distance back, but I'll be what? I have binoculars, so I'll, it's like I'm up close, and I'll be watching you while you die on the cross because you are headed for the cross. Direction. You have selected the cross. Good for you, Jesus. See, I really like this. Jesus died for me and I get off scot-free. See, I really like that. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I know it was necessary for him. I know, really, he needed to do it. I know, wow, what a sacrifice. Leaped from his throne, came to the cross. I know that that was necessary. And I couldn't have redemption without it. So, oh, oh I'm grateful. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm grateful. But you know, there's more to it than that. There is this connection. See, somehow what's happening is, in this passage, that's upsetting the disciples so much, oh, yeah, that Jesus is going to a cross, that upsets them. They don't want a bleeding, suffering, dying Messiah, that's for sure. I mean, that wouldn't be our choice for you, Jesus, but if you got to, go and do it, and hey, but uh, we'll hang back, yeah, yeah, call us when it's over, will you? Uh, see, we can handle that. So, yeah, the disciples are upset that Jesus is going to a cross. But see, what's absolutely intolerable, what they absolutely cannot buy into, what they will not, they will not accept is that there's a cross for them. That as certainly as he was going to the cross, so they are to go to the same cross. As certainly as he is embracing the cross, so they are to embrace the same identical cross. That the, his cross is really their cross. That's an amazing fact. And that's really tough on them. See, the direction, that's not too tough. We can put up with that. And the selection, yeah, he's really stubborn about this, but it seems to help him. Okay, do it. But this connection, that I am drug into the middle of this, that I am intimately connected to this, that there is a cross for me as well. And that bleeding, suffering, dying is not just that which is he is going to do. Bleeding, suffering, and dying is that which he's called me to do. And that I'm right in the middle of this. And hey, I can't get out of this. And if I'm going to be a kingdom person, if I'm going to live in intimacy with Christ, then, then I, I, I don't have any choice on this, that he is calling me into this strongly. Now, there's no way to read this passage, is there, without that? This connection is everywhere, isn't it? There's no way to rationalize it our way, is there? The statements are so bold, aren't they? For instance, chapter 16, look at it again. Verse 24, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Which again, we discovered that the impact of that whole thing is not that, oh, here are three criteria that I must meet up to. No, it's not that at all. Well, yeah, I got to deny myself. And yeah, I got to take up my cross. And yeah, I got to follow him. Okay, I'll do those three things. Then I can be his disciple. Then I can be in the kingdom. No, that's not it at all. Because that waters it down, see? Because that means, well, I'm attempting to deny myself. You know, I'm doing better. I'm doing better at following him that I am taking up my cross. Or, oh no, Lily, I, I'm doing real good in taking up my cross, but that denying thing is a little difficult. So I haven't got, how much do I need to deny myself? Then we can sit around and debate all that and have lists. We can do exactly what the Pharisees did with the law, man. By the time they got interpreting the law, they had 613 oral traditions about the law. 
So there was laws to interpret the laws, and then there, was an, there were more laws to interpret the interpretation of the laws. And then there were laws to interpret the laws that were interpreted by the interpretations of the law. So that's what we end up with. And before you get done, you, you, you've, you've watered down the whole thing and it's meaningless. So that's not what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying in verse four, uh, 24, as we discovered is, that hey, if you become a part of me, hey, if you get in on me, hey, if my nature comes to indwell you, hey, if I indwell you, I can tell you what's going to take place. You are going to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That these are the results of getting into me. Once my nature is in you, once you come into the heart of Christianity, once you get in the throb of this thing, man, once you begin to see the truth and reality of it, I am the truth. Once you get into me and my nature begins to spill in you, you can count on it. This is going to be the result. So you don't get into the cross to get into him. You get into him and he gets you into the cross because you are incapable of doing this. He's got to come and indwell you. He's got to live within you. He's got to produce the cross style through you. And if that doesn't take place, man. Hey, the cross will never be reality for you. So do you see how strong Jesus is on this? He is absolutely dead set on the cross and he's absolutely dead set on your connection with the cross. That this is not something he did for me. This is something he's doing with me. I am crucified with Christ. That his death is literally my death and I'm to join him in the style of the cross. And Jesus is absolutely determined that that's going to be. Now it certainly is true in chapter 17 uh, over at verse 12. He is pulling his disciples right in the middle of this. And again we've discussed this. It's all about John the Baptist. And he says, but I say to you, verse 12, chapter 17, I say to you that Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is about to suffer at their hand. Hey guys, I'm not alone on this. If you think I'm some lone ranger out here, trekking along, headed for the cross, well, that's what he wants to do, but we choose not to. I'm not alone on this. Hey, John the Baptist was in on this. He foreran this. I'm the Messiah. I'm pulling it off. Come on, guys. Forerunner, doesn't that tell you something? This is the plan of God. And if you're going to be a part of it, you'd better get in on the plan. This isn't just for me. This was for John the Baptist. This is for you. Hey, I'm embracing a cross. You're to embrace the cross. Come on, guys. We're headed for the cross together. And hey, guys, we are stubborn-minded. We are single-minded, stubbornly fixed on the business of the cross. And I'm calling you to it. Hey, this is where we're going. This is what it's all about. So you see, everywhere you go in these passages, you come back to the fact that there is this connection. Jesus is drawing us right into the midst of the experience of the cross. I'd like to ask you if you've had that experience. Oh, not just an experience, lifestyle. But you need an experience. Not just an event, but oh yeah, lifestyle. But you need the event. I want to know if, if you've ever come right up to head on, brother, head on, hey, dying to yourself. Crisis moment. Laid at his feet. Opened yourself up. Hey, I'm done, Jesus. Take me to your cross. Crucify me. I can't surrender like I ought to. Uh, I can't live like I ought to. I can't think thoughts I ought to think. I'm totally incapable of pulling this off. I can't minister like I ought to. Everything that's self-sourced in my life is, is, is greatly anemic and lacks, strongly lacks. I, I, I'm, I'm sick of it, Jesus. I want to come to you. Take me to your cross. Because I want to die that you might live. Come and live through me. And when you live through me, I know you're going to live the style of the cross. I'm ready for you to take my hands and involve them in nothing but redemptive ministry. I'm willing for you to take my face, my lips, my whole motive of my system. Oh God, purge me to the depth until the whole motive of my system is one single motive. Oh, spill your life out. Give yourself away. I want it to be instinctive within me. I want 
want it to be the throb of my brain, the focus of my mind. I want it to be the throb of my heart. I want it to be the extension of my hands. I want every muscle of my body to lean itself in this direction. I, I'm sick of the protect yourself guard. I'm sick of that, Jesus. I want to lay my life down. I want to do it in my home. I want to do it in ministry. I want to do it at the school. I want to do it everywhere. I want my whole life to be an expression of you. And that's an expression of the cross. Please, Jesus, I want to bear in my body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in my mortal flesh. Oh, to be the stage upon which he acts. Has that happened to you? It can. It should. It must. There'll be no redemptive ministry without it.